You know, as a pastor, I get a lot of interesting questions. Some of them are, are pretty easy to answer. Uh, I give this every once in a while. Do you have a real job? <laughs> nope. I just sit around, read the Bible, pray, go play golf, show up on Sunday, see what comes out. Uh, are you and Cindy going to have any more children? You know, in the 80s, there was a TV show. Some of you remember the title was Eight is Enough. Yeah, well, we're going with Two is Enough. Uh, we are not the Duggars. Just... Here's another one I get asked every once in a while. Can you perform a ceremony just short of marriage for people living together? Not sure what I'd call that or what I'd say. Uh, Every once in a while I'm asked, why do you need notes for preaching? Why don't you just depend on the Holy Spirit? It's a great question. And I usually respond with the question, have you ever watched me without notes? Now I say some good things, but, and it can be really fun and funny, but me without filters is really dangerous. We want my filters on. Uh, we had Tuesday services for several months where filters were off. And you will, that will be the blooper video this year, and you will understand why I use notes. Other questions are more challenging, take more time to answer. Questions like, why do bad things happen to good people? How can a loving God allow suffering? Do you ever have doubts? Can God really forgive me for what I've done? Here's a tough one. If God knew my spouse was going to cheat on me, why did he let me marry him? Why did God allow coronavirus? Why should I trust you when I was hurt in my last church? People ask a lot of questions. One of the areas where they, they really have questions is heaven. And the questions about heaven are all over the map. Is heaven a real place or is heaven just a metaphor? At least once a month I get asked, will my dog be in heaven? Will there be golf courses in heaven? Eternity seems like a long time. Aren't we going to get bored in heaven? Will I have a perfect, thin, sculpted body in heaven? Will I recognize my husband in heaven? And related to that, do I have to recognize my husband in heaven? When I was younger in ministry, I felt the need to answer every question because I, I wanted people to see their pastor as knowledgeable and wise. And now with a little more wisdom, uh, I'm more willing to say, well, I don't know. And when I do that, people inevitably say, well, you're the pastor, you're supposed to know. Guess what? I don't know everything. I, I don't know if your dog will be in heaven. I do have a feeling when you get to heaven that your first instinct isn't gonna be to look for Fido. Yeah, I think you're going to be going for Jesus. I don't know what you're going to look like. I can't imagine you looking any better than you look right now. Now, I understand there are bright lights in my eyes, so you all just look like faceless blobs, but I don't know if there will be golf courses in heaven. If there are, I can't wait to see my score. No one really knows. I, I mean, they write books and blogs, they even make movies, but nobody knows. So people ask questions and buy books because they really want to know. Marketers play on the ideas that their product is heavenly, and they describe things as heavenly that aren't even close. Uh, these are heavenly organics, double dark chocolate honey patties with only two ingredients, dark chocolate and raw white honey. They left out sugar. It's not candy if it doesn't have sugar. Heavenly Halo Herbal Hair Tonic and Soy Milk Deep Hydration Shampoo. I, I'm just, I'm not sure you can call shampoo heavenly. How about this? Heavenly Scents 
handmade goat milk soap. Listen to what it promises. Rainy, salty, misty fragrance made up of basil, green leaf, and ozone notes. Ozone? <laughs> Have you ever been taking a bath and thought, huh, I'd sure like to smell like ozone today. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just not seeing that. Here's another one. Heavenly hunks. Not me. It's this. Um, <laughs> It wasn't that funny, ma'am. <laughs> Ridiculously amazing organic oatmeal dark chocolate. Gluten-free. See, I understand. Some people, you have to eat gluten-free. But for me, if it doesn't have gluten, it's not good. <laughs> and I, I, Cindy say, what do you want for dinner? Uh, just a big old heap and plate of gluten. It would be great. <laughs> I love gluten. Um, this one, I think this one is kind of it. It's a canine relaxation product. It's true. The original Heavenly Hounds peanut butter flavored relaxation square. And you can get it with or without hemp. I'll let you kind of insert your own punchline there. When we had a dog, the last thing our dog needed was some hemp. I mean, those things aren't heavenly. That's just marketing. But we've all done it at one time or another. Describe something as heavenly. I I've done it. Here, I've got a basket I'm going to give away to a kid today. And I'm going to draw a number in a minute. But these are all things that I've described as heavenly at one time or another. And Andy's gift card. Isn't it wonderful that Andy's is now in North Little Rock? Mm -hmm. Can I get a witness? Uh, Rice Krispie squares. I love Rice Krispie treats. A brownie, of course, with icing, because if it doesn't have icing, it's not a brownie, and it's sure not heavenly. It's that other place. Um, Arkansas sweet dark chocolate, a Kaya bar. That's really good. 500 power bucks, so you can buy stuff. The greatest candy, Chuckles. I love Chuckles. I eat a pack of Chuckles a day. Anybody never had Chuckles? That's so sad. <laughs> and then the, the box for this last one says, health and happiness, let health and happiness surround you. Of course it will with your own remote-controlled Porsche. Kind of like that. I'm going to draw a number. Draw a number for a kid. All the kids have numbers. Number 28. Who's number 28? She's embarrassed. All right. Come on up here. Oh, see, that's a good mom. She's putting her mask on her. Good. I got in trouble last service because neither me nor the kid was wearing a mask, but this service were appropriate. <laughs> Have you ever had chuckles? Never? Are your parents mean? <laughs> Here you go. Enjoy. And you can eat chuckles now. They're the greatest thing you've ever eaten. You're going to love them. Since we can't fathom heaven with our earthly minds, we reduce it to something we can imagine. And as a result, we have a picture of heaven as earth with really great weather and no problems. But is that it? Some people view heaven as a crutch, an imaginary escape hatch that Christians cling to. But interestingly, even when I do funerals for people who have no relationship with Jesus and no connection to God. Every time the family talks about them being in heaven. For the follower of Jesus, heaven's not a fantasy, an escape hatch, or some imaginary place made by Hollywood. Heaven's real. It is the reward for living a life of faithful obedience to Jesus on earth. Revelation chapter 21 and 22 
gives us a beautiful picture of heaven. As we read through this passage, try to imagine. One of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues came and said to me, Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And he carried me away in the spirit to a mountain great and high and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem. Coming down out of heaven from God, it shone with the glory of God and its brilliance was like that of a very precious jewel, like a jasper, clear as crystal. It had a great high wall with 12 gates and with 12 angels at the gates. On the gates were written the names of the 12 tribes of Israel. There were three gates on the east, three on the north, three on the south, and three on the west. The wall of the city had 12 foundations, and on them were the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. The angel who talked with me had a measuring rod of gold to measure the city, its gates, and its walls. The city was laid out like a square, as long as it was wide. He measured the city with the rod and found it to be 12,000 stadia in length, and as wide and high as it is long. He measured its wall and it was 144 cubits thick by man's measurement, which the angel was using. The wall was made of jasper and the city of pure gold, as pure as glass. The foundations of the city walls were decorated with every kind of precious stone. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third chalcedony, the fourth emerald, the fifth sardonyx, the sixth carnelian, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth barrel, the ninth topaz, the tenth chrysoprase, the eleventh jacinth, and the twelfth amethyst. The twelve gates were twelve pearls, each gate made of a single pearl. The great street of the city was pure gold, like transparent glass. I did not see a temple in the city, because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are His temple. The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light and the Lamb is His Lamb. The nations will walk by His light, and the kings of the earth will bring their splendor into it. On no day will His gates ever be shut, for there will be no night there. The glory and honor of the nations will be brought into it. Nothing impure will ever enter it, nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb, down the middle of the great street of the city. On each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city, and His servants will serve Him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. There will be no more night. They will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun. For the Lord God will give them light, and they will reign forever and ever. You know, I can't wait. But even with that amazing description, you still can't imagine heaven. In the final hours of his life, Jesus spent time with his closest followers. And after telling the disciples that they would face difficulty, persecution, and hardship, Jesus offered these words of encouragement. He said, don't let your hearts be troubled. In spite of all that, don't be worried. Don't be afraid. Trust in God. Trust in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me so you may be where I am. When his time on earth ended, Jesus returned to his father's house, heaven, and he went there to prepare a place for you and for me. The promise of heaven means you have a new home. Skip Heitzig wrote it like this. Heaven is the final frontier. Heaven has always been the preoccupation of God's people filling us with hope and expectation. Holding on to heaven should give us a very light touch on the world. 
When we compare life here on earth to life in heaven, we can clearly see we haven't even yet begun to live. Real life starts when we're home with God. Now, some of you may wonder why I skipped the first couple verses of Revelation 21. It's because I want to go back and I want to show you this incredibly encouraging promise that we look at today. Revelation 21, verse 1, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. There was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne. In the book of Revelation, when you read that, a loud voice, it's a sign. Pay close attention because what happens next is really important. I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. And now here's our promise. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death, no mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. See, the Bible does not ignore the reality of pain, death, and suffering in this world, but it promises that all those tears will be wiped away in heaven. This is a theme in Scripture. God delivers people from their tears. Psalm 116 says, Thou hast delivered mine eyes from tears. Psalms 126, They that sow in tears reap in joy. Jesus said, Blessed are you who hunger now, for you will be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Psalm 30 says, Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. One day soon, when you get to heaven, there will be no more death, no more mourning, no more crying, and no more pain. Sadness and sorrow will no longer exist. The hurts you suffered here on earth will be erased. Abuse and pain will no longer haunt you. Shame will be no more. Humiliation and heartache will be forgotten. Hate, anger, and injustice will all be made right. You may cry hot tears now, but when you get to heaven, God is going to wipe every tear from your eye. Come on, that's, that's something to celebrate. Death and disease are going to be replaced by life. Pain will be replaced by healing. Instead of mourning, there's going to be dancing. Sorrow will be replaced by rejoicing. Tears will be replaced by laughter. Sadness will be replaced by joy. Instead of worrying, you're going to worship. Fear is going to be replaced by assurance. And defeat will be replaced by victory. Death and tears and sorrow and hurt may be with us now, but one day soon, they're all going to be wiped away. One day soon. Verse 5 says, He who is seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. From the throne of power and authority, Jesus makes all things new. No more questions, no more fights, no more racism, no more prejudice, no more coronavirus, no more face masks, no more arguing and fighting, no more wondering, because one day soon, everything is going to be made new. We've had it so good for so long, people have started believing the promise of God is that we'll be happy, healthy, and wealthy while we're here on earth. And then came 2020. Huh? And suddenly people are remembering that God never promised that earth, earth is going to be uh, trouble-free, worry-free, and always filled with joy. This world always has been and always will be filled with trouble. But this earth is not our, our aim. Heaven is our goal. And when you reach heaven, that's when you'll finally be home. No more striving, no more struggling, no more worrying, no more wondering, no more sickness, no more pain, no more disease, no more death. That's where we're going. We're going home. It was years ago. Feels like yesterday. 
I was on a flight back to Little Rock, and on that flight, there were a, a number of servicemen and women coming back from Iraq. And I got off the plane with several of them right behind me, and somehow two of their spouses had gotten past security and were waiting at the end of the runway. It was a touching reunion. I walked down the hall with several soldiers and airmen right behind me. And in the distance, I saw a huge crowd gathered. There were balloons and banners. There were grandparents and grandchildren and children and spouses. And I, I was fairly certain it wasn't a welcome home for me. <laughs> As we came through security, all of a sudden, the crowd began to clap and cheer. And that, that roar of noise filled the airport. Then a little boy and girl busted through the crowd and ran to their dad. And he picked them up in both arms, tears rolling down his face. A lady broke through the line to embrace her husband. They're both crying. And I, I walked past that crowd, and as I got past them, suddenly it hit me. I sensed this whispered in my spirit, that's a welcome home from war, but that's just a little taste of what heaven's going to be like. I started crying. I turned around and watched the reunion and began to think about another reunion. One day, when you reach your goal, a crowd too big to count who've reached the goal before you will be waiting as you enter the gates of heaven. Precious men and women of God who are dear to you on earth will be there as part of heaven's welcome party. But as, as much as you get excited about seeing all the wonderful people who've gone before you that you love, that's not the best part of heaven. In heaven, you get to see Jesus face to face. William Montague Dyke was blinded in an accident. In spite of his disability, he graduated from university in England with honors. Well, in school, he fell in love with the daughter of a high-ranking British naval officer. They got engaged. Shortly before the wedding, William had eye surgery. If the surgery succeeded, he would see if it failed, he would remain blind the rest of his life. William insisted on keeping the bandages on his face until his wedding day because if the surgery was successful, he wanted the first person he saw to be his new bride. The wedding day arrived. The guests included royalty, cabinet members, uh, countless VIPs. William's father, Sir William Hart Dyke, and the doctor who performed the surgery stood next to the groom, his eyes still covered with bandages. The organ played the wedding march, and the bride slowly walked down the aisle to the front of the church, and as soon as she arrived at the altar, the surgeon took a pair of scissors out of his pocket and cut the bandages from William's eyes. You can imagine the tension in the room as everyone held their breath and waited to find out if William could see the woman standing before him. And as he stood face to face with his bride-to-be, his words echoed through the cathedral, you are more beautiful than I ever imagined. One day soon, you'll stand face to face with Jesus. You'll see his face for the first time, and his glory will be more magnificent than anything you've ever imagined in this life. I can't wait for that day. I can't wait to see Jesus, the one I've lived for, the one who died for me. When you get to heaven, you get to see Jesus. Eliza Hewitt was born in 1851 in Philadelphia. She was valedictorian of her school. She became a public school teacher and worked in a school for troubled children. One day, Tragically, she was beaten by one of her students, permanently injured. They didn't know if she would walk again. And after the attack, she spent six months in a heavy cast. When her doctor finally released her to go cut the cast off, let her walk in the park, the moment was such a spiritual experience for her that she came back home and she wrote a hymn titled, Sunshine in My Soul. I want you to listen to the words. There is sunshine in my soul today, more glorious and bright than glows in any earthly sky, for Jesus is my light. Oh, there is sunshine, blessed sunshine, when the peaceful, happy moments roll, 
when Jesus shows his smiling face, there's sunshine in my soul. Sadly, Eliza's recovery was short. She was soon confined to her bed with a debilitating spinal problem, unable to walk. Her teaching career was over. But in bed, Eliza turned from teaching to songwriting. Rather than becoming bitter, she began to look to Jesus and think about heaven. In fact, one of her best known hymns is about heaven. And these words take on a powerful meaning when you imagine them written and sung from the bed of an invalid. I used to run distances um, before I wrecked my body. And so now a couple miles is about all I've got in me. And I, I used to love watching distance races. I, I so remember the marathon in the 2008 Summer Olympics. I sat in front of the TV more than two hours watching the runners run through the streets of Beijing. I made my sons watch with me. They were really excited about that. <laughs> Midway through the race, Samuel Wanjiru pulled away from the pack. And with a few miles left, he was running at an Olympic record pace, but running all by himself. And the announcers wondered if he could possibly sustain that pace and finish the race. Then one announcer said, when he rounds the next corner, he'll see the bird's nest, the stadium in the distance. And knowing the end is in sight will give him new strength to make it. And sure enough, a few minutes later, Samuel reached that spot. And as he came around a corner, he could see the stadium. If you watched him close, you could see his stride pick up. The turnover was faster. He wasn't laboring any longer. He was almost there. Samuel ran through the parking lot. Then he entered the tunnel leading from the parking lot to the field. And as he ran down the tunnel for the first time, he could hear the roar of the crowd. 91,000 people had been waiting two hours to welcome him at the finish. When Samuel exited the tunnel, entered the stadium, that crowd went absolutely nuts. On Samuel's final lap, the crowd chanted and cheered him to the finish line, and he did not look like a tired runner anymore. He had energy and strength as he ran to the finish. Samuel had run alone for a long time, but he wasn't alone any longer. There was a massive crowd cheering as he crossed the finish line as he finished his race. You probably figured it out. I cry easy. <laughs> and watching that, my eyes filled with tears. Not for an Olympic record marathon, although that impressed me, but I couldn't help but think of another finish line. And choking back that tears, I told my boys, imagine, that's just an Olympic race for a little medal you wear around your neck. One day, heaven's going to be so much better than that. And our welcome is going to be so much bigger. Paul wrote in 2 Timothy chapter 4, I'm already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time has come for my departure. I've fought the good fight. I've finished the race. I've kept the faith. And now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness with the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day, and not just to me, but to all those who've longed for his appearing. When you run a race, there is going to be difficult times. That's part of it. There are times you're going to suffer. There are times you will be tempted to quit. And it's in those times. Just like Paul, you have to focus on what's ahead of you. You're not running a race to nowhere. The finish line is just ahead. And for the follower of Jesus, heaven is the finish line. One day soon, you and I will cross the finish line and enter our heavenly home. And when you get to that finish line, everything you've given, everything you've done, every hour you've spent serving God, 
every dollar you've given, it's all going to be worth it. If you can just get a glimpse of the finish line, it will change you forever. Paul wrote 2 Corinthians chapter 4, for our light and momentary troubles. Now, let me give you perspective. He said light and momentary troubles. So what were those light and momentary troubles? Paul had been beaten, put in prison, beaten again, left for dead, put in prison again, beaten, persecuted, hated, stoned, all those things. He looked back now, as he got further along in his life, he looked back and said, those light momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. In other words, I'm not even gonna think about that stuff because of what's ahead. And then he said this, and this is the lesson for us today. So we fix our eyes, not on what's seen, what's happening right now, what's going on around us, what people are arguing and fighting about, not on, not on this stuff. We fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen. For what is seen, it's temporary, here today, gone tomorrow. But what is unseen is eternal. It lasts forever. See, there, there are too many discouraged, defeated Christians right now. And the reason why is we got confused about the finish line. The point of this race is not what we accomplish or achieve on earth. The point of this race is we are going to be in heaven with Jesus forever. We have that promise. And he told us while we're here, it's going to be tough. There's going to be troubles. But focus not on here, but there. Not now, but then. So keep running through the disappointments, the defeats, the doubts, the fear, the letdowns, the put downs. Don't let anything stop you from running to that finish line. Keep running because the finish line is in sight. Heavenly Father, would you forgive us for our unnatural attachment to this world? Lord, somehow we've, we've gotten confused and we've decided this is the point and this is the payoff and this is the reward. Would you remind us of what's ahead? Lord, I pray that we would become heavenly minded, focusing on what's ahead. Because when we see that, it allows us to move through all the challenges and difficulties of this world. Lord, thank you for the promise of heaven. Thank you that one day soon, there'll be no more mourning. There'll be no more tears. There'll be no more sorrow or sadness, sickness or pain or death. Instead, Lord, we'll be with you forever. What a powerful service. I love church and I love going to church with you online. Thanks for joining us today. I am grateful you are a part of our online community. If you experience the Lord in a special way, or maybe you just want to share your story, I'd love to hear from you. You can email me anytime throughout the week directly at ploy at firstnlr.com. Don't forget to follow us on social media and stay up to date with everything First NLR. One of our team members is posting those links in the chat right now. And make sure to download the First NLR app so we can send you updates and you can watch any message online at any time. If you'd like to know more about the online community or get more involved, check out the What's Next tab at the bottom of chat. We don't want you to just be a viewer. We want you to be a part of our diverse community of believers from around the world. Thanks for coming to church today, and I pray the Lord's blessings on you and your family this week. See you next week.